Okay, this is section 12A, catalysts. It's just information. There's no no homework to do, and there's kind of a um, it actually applies to the reaction mechanism worksheet as well. But um, but anyway, there's just some stuff and also some things just to kind of clear up. It's in 12A in the notes. And this is something you could also read about, read through in the book. Just want you to, to kind of be aware of it, some information. Um, let me see. First, let me also remind you of something that I I don't know if I said it clear enough or whatever the case was. But like this word molecularity, oh boy, I'm using my notes here for my, oh wait, there, this will do it, right? Yeah, molecularity just talks about the number of molecules that have to collide that are involved in an, at an elementary step. I don't know if I wrote that. Did I write that in the elementary step in the word there? Well, anyway, for when we talk about first order, second order, third order, that has to do with um, that reaction. How Well, the reactant. Does the reactant's collision depend on a first, second, third, or fourth order? All right. Um, molecularity talks about how many particles have to combine in order for the, um, the step to occur. Like if two molecules collide, then that would be called bimolecular. If only one molecule does it, then it would be unimolecular. Like maybe one molecule hits against the wall or something like that. You can imagine that to be the case. Or, um, and then ter, ter, I'm sorry, termolecular is when there's three, but that's, that's kind of a rare one. Zero order, also, uh, a zero order rate is when, um, when the reaction rate does not depend on the concentration of a reactant, but instead it depends on, like, maybe a catalyst being present or maybe, um, like, ultraviolet light could sometimes cause something to, to occur. Um, but anyway, let me, I just want to bring those up. So on that page where, this is in your notes, I didn't tell you where it was, it's under... 12.6, back in 12.6, it talked about four classifications of molecularity. Just know that molecularity ap applies to each elementary step. Now, I'm going to come back and show you that in a moment when, we, when we're doing this on ca catalysts. Okay, catalysts um, are substances that when, when they are present, they can cause a chemical reaction to occur faster. Now, I mentioned this also in terms of the energy diagram. Like if an energy, energy diagram looked like this, here are your reactants, okay, and here are your products, and here's the, you know, the intermediate activated, activated complex. The intermediate that was formed. Is it, that's it right here, the I. Okay. This will be obviously exothermic in this reaction. And remember, we talked about activation energy is from the react, reactant level up to the highest point. That's called activation energy. But when you have a catalyst, what it does is it, it causes less energy to be required to get um, in order to get to the intermediate. Okay, so it might be like this. So now, with, when you have the catalyst, you can form the intermediate well, I'll put the same area there at a, with a lower amount of energy. So that will be the catalyst. The, the um, that will be the, the activation energy for a catalyzed reaction right there. Up to up to well, it'd be for the highest point wherever that would be. So I guess I'll just end it right there alongside of that one. But that will be for the for the uncatalyzed reaction. Now, um, an example. I think one of the best examples of a catalyst is um on twelve eight, and I I gave you I got this from a another source. But it just shows hydrogen gas reacting with C2H2. Oh, boy. I have a problem here with this. Let me... <laughs> looks like my... Oh, no. There I go. Let's see. Does it work? All right. We're back. Hydrogen gas reacting with C2H2 to give you C2H4. Now, what is C2H2? That is... Me not methane, but ethyne, and that will be ethene. So actually you have hydrogen reacting with it's also called acetylene. And so actually what happens is the H's break apart 
and one H joins onto this, it, it breaks the double one of the triple bonds. So one one of the H's attaches to this carbon and one to that carbon. So then you end up with this, which is ethene. It's a little bit of a review of organic ethine ethene. So this reaction can occur, but I don't know the whole. I don't know the the kinetics of it, you know, per, um, particularly. But what will happen is this will maybe take a long time to occur because it, it takes a long time for the hydrogen molecules to, to get in the right place. H2 molecule has to collide pretty much right there, probably right on that on that double bond on those pi electrons. It probably has to grab it and then attach to this one attach to one carbon and that to the other during the mechanism. Okay? Well, this shows you the mechanism. What happens when you have a um, when you have a catalyst? Now a catalyst might be like in this case it says nickel. A lot of times it's a metal. Now H two is a gas, and these are all gases. Yeah, in this reaction, gas, gas, gas. By the way, the word heterogeneous catalyst, all that means is. Like, if we have gases reacting, gas, gas, produce a gas, but they're all in the gas state, but the catalyst is in the solid state. So that's what they mean by heterogeneous catalyst means a catalyst is in a different state than the reactants and products there. All right. So nickel metal, remember in the crystal, actually, I should draw them, they're a lot larger than these molecules, okay? And even, the, even their own diagrams don't do it well. Oh, well, I'll just draw it like this. I, they don't do a lot of justice to it. But you have this big crystal of nickel, all right? And so what happens, I'll just put all these atoms all along the way. You got this crystal, however they're packed. Oh, I don't know how nickel would be, but okay. And so forth and so forth. Okay, we got the idea. All right, so... Look, I'll come along to this diagram and show it to you. I know what a what a low tech way to do this. Actually, I might be able to flip it. Let's see if it'll. Oh no, it won't work that way. Ah, uh, not on mine. All right, if I can go one by one. First, it says in the first little block of this, the hydrogen and ethene molecules collide with the nickel surface. So what they do is they actually attach to the nickel surface. Hydrogen like this, and the eth and the ethene ethine. I'm sorry, ethine. You know what? Um, they, ha, I got this from somewhere, and th they did it wrong. They named it wrong. What a bad thing! I should correct it. That is ethene, not ethene, and they wrote ethene down there. They wrote, they did it wrong. They should be in one more line there on that, and they have it going to ethene. Ha! Huh. Well. Oh, well, I'll tell you what, we'll just do this. If I change this to C2H4, now, ah, let's just change our reaction so that, that their thing will work, because that's the reaction they wrote, C2H4. But this time, it's not my, not my error, but now you end up with C3H6. So now what happens you got hydrogen molecule and you have C, I'm sorry, that would be ethene. Okay, now you produce ethane. Aha, uh -huh. so we're getting a good review of our organic. We did ethine, ethene, and now ethane. Okay, so anyway. I can just change that. But that was that was a reaction that I had there. But anyway, the same process, same thing happens. So what happens is it said the there's an attraction between the nickel and the hydrogen. That the hydrogen is able to make a temporary, like I wouldn't want to call it really a bond, but an attraction. This hydrogen gas can be up there, kind of stuck in place on the nickel. Meanwhile, you can also have a molecule of, I guess it shows it like that, ethene also 
um, hooked onto it. Like I, I, they put a little dotted line to show it. So the catalyst, what happens is the reactants, the gaseous reactants, attach to the catalyst. Now, why would that help the reaction? You might think, well, wait a minute, that's going to stop them. No, it doesn't. Because while these are attached, guess what's floating around and, and colliding and all? Or the other hydrogens can come along, and it's easier now for another hydrogen molecule to come along and, and attach to this one. Or these can migrate together. They can actually move and migrate. Let's just see. I think it's going to show this, how they show it in this one. So first, they, the molecules attach. Then it says both become absorbed onto the catalyst surface by intermolecular forces. So I was kind of showing you that. Then it says the H, H half of the C in the CC bond are broken with nickel. Chem, chem, chem absorption. Chem absorption. Oh, he said, oh yeah, so there is a broken, the double bond breaks and the bond between hydrogens break. And then it says the NIH and IC bonds break. CH font forms um, an ethane molecule temporarily held, but will be ready to break free of the catalyst surface. Yeah. Okay, so they do migrate over is what they're showing you. Well, anyway, that, so there's two ways to think about it. One is it, I think I think of it that way too. That must also occur. While this is trapped in place, first of all, another C2H2, it might make it easier, an easier target to get collided by with another molecule of H2 or, or of the C2H4 over here to come down to collide with that. But then they can also be absorbed. I am not going to ask you to, to um, describe that step by step. I just found that as an ex example to show you of why a catalyst can help a reaction occur faster. So it makes it more favorable. So you don't need as much energy for them colliding because one thing, I like to think, well, those are now set still. Other things can collide with them. Or also because of the bonding between the catalyst, they're able to, to migrate over and move. All right. That is a heterogeneous catalyst, and that's about all you need to know of that. Absorption, the next page, when one, uh, it says collecting one surface, surface onto the surface of another. Absorption is penetrating one surface with another. Okay. Um, all right, that is describe it in the next page. It's not a big deal. I'm not even going to go through all the steps. The Haber process is another example of heterogeneous cat catalysis catalysis and this is a really amazing one and if you saw the the UCLA program um, Mr. Walker talked about this as well to make ammonia to create ammonia these gases had to form ammonia gas and they were talking about how this was needed the Germans needed to make ammonia during World War One in order to keep their, in order to keep explosive, making explosives when they were fighting against the, um, the Allies. So um, they didn't know a way to do this reaction fast, and so Fritz Haber figured out a way to do it. And really, all you had to do was you'd use a catalyst, and it was, I think, just ru iron, rusty, old rusty sheet of iron, like rusted iron, iron oxide. So iron oxide catalyst. Iron oxide, iron oxide, iron oxide, like that. Rusty piece of metal, when you put it inside this, well, somehow, I don't know the mechanism, but these, the nitrogens attach, like you saw there, and it probably breaks those bonds. The triple bonds are a tough one to break open, okay? And then the hydrogens can also attach, you can imagine. Sorry. And then, anyway, they can migrate or be tar easier targets. So that was another one. Fritz Haber, and it said one thing sad is that he was also called the the um, the father of chemical warfare. So there was two things interesting about Haber. One is that, as I mentioned, yeah, father of chemical warfare because he, he not only did he figure out how to make explosives, but he also figured out ways to make hot cyanide gas, which was uses used on um in, by Hitler against people. Horrible. And Haber himself was actually Ger Jewish, part Jewish. So he had to leave Germany um, as a result. He couldn't practice his, um, do science anymore and teach because um, he was, yeah, Hitler would not allow that. It's kind of very sad, the Nazis. So um, Haber, anyway, it, it, was, it was just really a sad thing in there, his, his story. But the one good news, make, making ammonia also 
is needed for fertilizer. And so, um, like one thing that the, the Mr. Walker mentioned at UCLA, we would not be able to live on this earth today with, with all the people we have on this earth if it were not for amazing agriculture and fertilization that was found even from this process. So he was the he's like a, a father of like agriculture as well. His science helped agriculture tremendously. That was a good thing. Then there was also some bad uses of it. But as I said, you know, ultimately, um, he he wasn't really. I don't I don't see him so much as was he like part of the enemy or something. He had to run away from the enemy, you know, in um, in um, in World War II. So um, now it also talks about catalytic converters in automobiles. You've heard of that before. So it takes the gases that are burned off from your um, engine. You know, normally in the car, I mean, think about this. Normally in, in your automobile, octane burns to produce carbon dioxide and water. If your gasoline just burned completely clean, you have carbon dioxide and water coming out the exhaust, that wouldn't be too bad. But it's not. The fuel is not is not pure. Instead, it has some, it might have, you know, CHN and even some sulfurs in there. And sulfurs and um, nitrogen end up giving you SO2s, NO2s. Well, anyway, this causes pollution, pollutants in the air, and also acid rain, all that kind of stuff. All of this gets, gets produced as well. And so what happens is a catalytic converter allows this to re reaction to go a little bit better. It, it, I know, it actually converts these into, um, into things that are safer. Like I, it, it occur, uh, like even carbon monoxide would be another thing that could be produced, like carbon monoxide. So carbon, that's a good example. A catalytic converter could trap carbon monoxide, and then other oxygens can collide with it or migrate, you know, on the on the surface over to it. On the catalyst, catalytic converter might be like a metal piece, a, a piece that you put in your car, and you'll have. I've seen it before. They have all these ridges and all because that gives it more surface area, so that molecules can absorb onto it, and then like carbon monoxide might absorb which is dangerous, and then, well, the CO, and then oxygen can also absorb onto it, and then you can turn carbon monoxide into carbon dioxide, and that'd be a, that's a good thing, actually. So, all right. Now, the last thing I'll mention, and this is it, is homogeneous catalyst, and this just talks about if they're both in the same phase. Like, what if I have two gases reacting, and the catalyst itself is also a gas? Now, this is something you saw, or if you haven't seen that reaction mechanism, you'll see it in that. And I'm just going to skip all the way down to the second page. It talks about another scientist, Friedrich Schoenbein, who discovered ozone. And um, anyway, he named it for the Greek smell. It makes a, makes a smelling sound. You notice that um, when there's a storm sometimes, you have this weird smell in the air. You can, you're smelling ozone afterwards. And it doesn't happen a whole lot in California, but in other areas it will, where, where there's a lot of storm rain. Um, so here's a reaction, and it talks about this. There is in the atmosphere, you know, number one gas is nitrogen, there is oxygen. You also have some nitrogen monoxide, which it would be actually like a like a pollutant, but naturally that occurs. So that that's in there, that's in there already. So we have a little bit of NO in the atmosphere. Now, um, what happens is this, NO is a gas, just like that's a gas, that's a gas, and this assists the process of turning oxygen into ozone. The reaction is three halves oxygen form O3. Now that's kind of weird, isn't it? You could also say three oxygens give you 2O3, 3O2 give you 2O3. So oxygen can turn into ozone because of nitrogen monoxide. So this, this also shows you why it's bad to have NO in the atmosphere, okay? Um, some, there is some natural, but again, in the, in the car, the catalytic converter, we talked about one thing you can get out of your car, you can get nitrogen monoxide, it can go up into the air, and it can, it can cause the oxygen to turn into ozone, okay, easier. Now, um, all right, here we go. So here is a mechanism. This is the overall reaction. I kind of did it backwards. And it says you have NO, one half O2 gives you NO2. 
Then you have NO2 giving you NO plus O. Then you have O plus O2 forming O3. Now, when you add them up, you're going to get the 3 half O2 plus. So it's really, this is, this is the way it makes sense to us. But they did this in the thermo form. I don't know why the mechanism is written that way, but it's written that way. Three halves gives you that. So here's the mechanism. Now here's the deal. First of all, they ask you at the bottom of this, if I add this up, notice the NO2s are going to cancel out. That will cancel, and that will cancel. Okay, the NOs are going to cancel. NO, NO is going to cancel. But then you have an O, and O, they're going to cancel. So one half O2 plus O2 gives you three halves O2. O3 is the only thing left over here. It goes up there. Well, here's the deal. So this, this kind of is a little review. It says on the question below it, in this process, which substance is the catalyst, which is an intermediate? So the catalyst here, remember, a catalyst is a material that it goes into a reaction and it comes out unchanged. Now, here's what's weird is that the catalyst it can react within the mechanism, but it will enter and leave the, in the same form. And I, I was kind of mentioning this on the reaction mechanism worksheet, but I, this was the best example. All of these are gases right here. All of them are. Nitrogen monoxide gas. So this is not a reactant. See? It's not a reactant. But it comes in, and it, the oxygen attaches to it to form NO2. NO2 then decomposes into another NO, and an O radical. They call that a free radical. O is like the, um, an oxygen is split apart, and that is highly reactive. That highly reactive O joins easily onto an O2 to make ozone O3. All of these are gases. So NO is the catalyst because it appears... It, it, it is, well, first of all, I'll say because it is unchanged unchanged in the mechanism you know it it comes in it is not it's not officially a reactant but it comes in as a reactant and it, it leaves as a, as a product so NO comes in and NO goes out all right it gets canceled away that's the definition of what a catalyst would be unchanged now along the way I made NO2 so I, I hate to say the word even unchanged but it went in and it came out the same. All right, that's just probably even a better way to say. It enters and leaves the same in the mechanism. Now, the um, the, the intermediate or intermediates, let's see, would be NO2 and O. NO2 and O. Because they are produced but then consumed in the in the um in the process, because they are both, are bo I, I say the same process, the, the um, mechanism, they are both produced, but then consumed in the, um, what would you call it, in the, me in the um, mechanism steps, elementary steps, okay? So I could easily see this as a multiple choice, and they could give you that. In fact, they could give you this and not even give you the overall equation here, and they could ask you, tell me, first of all, what are what is, for the overall equate reaction, what are the reactants? What are the products? Reactant, product. What are the, um, what are the, what is uh, the catalyst? If, if there's a catalyst, what would that be? NO comes in, and NO goes out. What are the intermediates? Intermediates, the key for intermediate is they have to be produced. So none of these in the beginning can be an intermediate. When you're, the first step, no way. But that might be an intermediate. Yeah, NO2, yes, NO2 con continues on. Um, then over also um, O is produced, and, it's, and then it's consumed here. Produced and consumed, produced, consumed. Okay, that I thought that was worth putting in there. Um, also, in, you've ever heard of enzymes. An enzyme is a catalyst also. And that is all. I just want you to be aware of that little bit. Oh, and I was going to tell you about the molecularity so you, you would know. 
So each elementary step, step number one, step number two, step number three, each one has a, a particular molecularity. Um, and what I mean is how many molecules combine now, oh, what a weird thing because, oh, it's so bad that they use the, the halves there. Huh. Well, um, oh, it's not very really good, but NO and half of O2, yeah, that would really be, that would really be two NOs and O2 to give you two NO2s. So that's not a great, this is not the best example, but, but what it would mean is that two of these have to collide with one of those. That would be a termolecular right there, that step. Three things. Molecular molecularity three. This step only one of these breaks into those two, so that would be um, a unimolecular, and this one would be a bimolecular. Wow, that, that shows you every case right there. That's pretty weird, pretty neat. Um, well, anyway, I guess I'd have to. Well, yeah, you'd have two of these, but you yeah there wouldn't be a one point five molecularity. That wouldn't be the case, and um and you could still say that like down here. Well, I, I want to bring into that. I just want to just want to review that little bit, those little bits of things. So, molecularity refers to how many molecules collide, or in this case, like a first order thing, how many um, are involved, collide, are involved in that step. In that step, only one is involved. Here, there are three technically, because I have to double those. And here, there would also be two two species, so two would have to be colliding there. All right. See you guys later on.